so uh, today what I want to talk about is, in general, um, uh, what I like to kind of call structure theorems um, for Legendrian knots. So, um, <coughs> so, uh, so I want to consider structure theorems. For Legendrian knots. And what I mean by this is um, we'd like to try to understand the structure, or say maybe the classification of Legendrian knots um, under um, some well understood, say, topological operation, like maybe connected sums, satellites, you know, whatever that might be. Um, so I'd like to maybe mention the first um, such theorem that I know of. So uh, several years ago, um, Kohanda. And I, um, so this is in 2003, I guess, is when it was published at least, um, <coughs> proved the following. So given two knots, K1 and K2, and so these are just topological knots. There's no Legendrians or anything going, you know, going on right now. Um, in S3, uh, <coughs> then there is a bijection. from ledge k1, ledge k2, modulo some equivalence, which I'll tell you about in a second, to ledge k1 connect sum k2. So of course, the simplest operation you probably know about knots is given two knots, you can form their connected sums. Just you know, put them next to each other, erase two arcs, and glue the endpoints. <coughs> um, so we want, so you got a map between uh, I guess I should say also what is my notation here. This just means um, the set of Legendrian knots um, up to isotopy in the knot type that's specified here. So if you know all the Legendrian, if you know the Legendrian knots for uh, all the Legendrian knots representing the smooth knot type K1, and you know them for K2, and you understand this equivalence relation, then you actually understand the connected sum. Okay. So what is this equivalence relation? So, um, so where equivalence is generated by two operations. Actually, usually it's only one operation. Um, the first one is, uh, oh, I didn't tell you what this map is, but you probably have a pretty good guess what this map is, right? If you have a, a pair, um, L1, so L for Legendrian, K for just smooth knots. So I'll just kind of put it in a little box here. And you've seen your front diagrams before, right? They always tend to have these little cusps on them. So I'll put a little cusp there. Um, and then if I have L2 and I have a little cusp there, then of course this is just going to get sent to L1, L2, where those cusps are removed and you're, you connect the knots. Right? So it's kind of the obvious map. It's not exactly 100% clear. It's a well-defined map. You can make it well-defined in lots of different ways, or you can just prove it diagrammatically. But anyway, it is well-defined. Um, so now where equivalence is generated by, I guess we'll have to move over here. So first of all, uh, if you have, say, L1, and you have a little piece over here, and you have L2, You see a little piece. So one thing you can do to knots is you can stabilize them. So suppose I put a little zigzag in over here. So that actually reduces the thurston binnikin and either increases or reduces the, thurston, uh, the, the rotation number, depending on orientations. By the way, I'm kind of going to be a little vague about orientations. But in this talk, you should think everything is oriented. All the knots have an orientation on them and, and so on. Um, I'm not going to really draw them. It's not going to be a big part here. But it is important that you actually take care of orientations. Um, <coughs> So of course, if I do this and I form the connected sum like this, notice there'll be this little zigzag on the bottom, right? And clearly, I could move the zigzag over here, and it could have been on this side, and I would have got the same thing, right? <coughs> so that has to be part of your equivalence. This is much easier for the yeah, there's not going to be too many complicated knots here. Um, well, at least that I'm going to draw or try to draw. Um, so clearly, that has to be in your equivalence, right? Um, and then secondly, there's another thing that has to clearly be in your equivalence. Suppose, for instance, K1 and K2 happen to be the same knot. Then you've got a symmetry where you kind of flip the pairs. So basically, you have this is your kind of contact geometric content. And then you've just got symmetries that come from topology. Um, 
and then uh, any obvious topological symmetries. So for instance, um, if k1 happens to be k2, then you have to allow l1, l2 is equivalent to l2, l1. Okay. So this is the theorem. And I mean, we actually originally proved the theorem just because it seemed like a natural thing to do. You have this topological operation. You'd like to understand how does it kind of play with uh, contact geometry? How do you understand Legendre knots in terms of this, this operation? Um, but there's a really nice kind of uh, consequence of a theorem like this. Um, so let me make a few remarks. And these remarks are supposed to help, help, hopefully motivate why you would care about structure theorems apart from just the intrinsic interest in in understanding how the topological and contact worlds kind of fit together. Um, so first of all, um, uh, this theorem gave the first classifications of uh, Legendrian knots in non Legendrian simple knot types. OK, so um, by the way, I'm going to use lots of uh, terminology here. And so if anything's unfamiliar, please stop me. But let me just you know, say here, um, what is a Legendrian simple knot type? A knot type, for instance, is Legendrian simple if this set is, an element in this set is completely determined by its simple invariance. And the simple invariance are the thurston binnikin so basically the framing, the contact structure gives to a Legendrian knot, and the rotation number, which is kind of a relative Euler class uh, for the Legendrian knot. So if those two very simple to compute invariants completely determine your Legendrian knot, you call it Legendrian simple. And if they don't, you say it's Legendrian non-simple. And while there were examples of Legendrian non-simple knots before this theorem, we didn't have a complete classification of knots in that knot type. And um, we got them here basically from connected sums of negative torus knots. So if you take almost any two negative torus knots and take their connected sum, that will not be Legendrian simple. Surprisingly enough, though, the negative torus knots themselves are Legendrian simple. But somehow, when you work out this, this equivalence relation and see what you get over on that set, you actually wind up getting things with the same thurston binnikin rotation, but are not um, isotopic. Interestingly enough, I'm actually pretty sure you also can't distinguish them using other invariants like contact homology. Um, you certainly can't do it through easy versions of it, but maybe the whole algebra does, but it's a super non-commutative thing that I wouldn't even want to try to actually say two things weren't actually isomorphic. But anyway, um, <coughs> so that's nice. Um, but even, even better, um, <coughs> these gave the first examples of a knot type um, such that for any uh, n and k positive integers, um, uh, there exists uh, n distinct Legendrians um, uh, that remain distinct after k stabilizations. Okay, So again, a little bit of context here. It's well known that if you have any two Legendrian knots, whether I actually have the same invariance or not, the same thurston binnikin rotation, if you have two knots, after stabilizing each one of them enough times, they'll eventually become Legendrian isotopic. But the question was, does it take one stabilization, two stabilizations? Most examples, one or two is enough. Um, but again, using these negative torus knots, we could find explicit examples um, where you had indistinct things. And no matter how you stabilize them, if you stabilize them less than k times, they would remain distinct. Now, of course, eventually, they'll have to become the same. But after k, they stay distinct. So the point is, these sort of structure theorems not only tell you nice things about the, the, how uh, topology and contact geometry play together, but it also helps you understand um, kind of important kind of qualitative features about Legendrian knot theory as a whole. So, so again, that's a little motivation for studying these sorts of theorems. And now um, 
let me move on to the main topic for today. So, um, so today we consider um, satellite um, operations. So let me just remind everybody what, what a topological satellite is. So, um, so suppose we're given, first of all, um, a knot K in S3. Um, this is uh, usually called um, the companion knot. Just some terminology. I don't know how much I'll use it, but I might slip and use it once or twice. So, so this knot is going to be called the companion knot. Two, um, a knot P in, um, I'm going to use a notation V, which is S1 cross S2, just the solid torus, um, <coughs> which is usually called the pattern. Um, <coughs> and finally, three, one more thing, um, a diffeomorphism, say phi, from V to a neighborhood of K. Okay. And let me remind you, um, this diffeomorphism is determined by a framing on K. Um, right, so if you kind of pick a preferred longitude for K or a preferred push off of K, that determines this diffeomorphism up to isotopy, which is all we really care about. Um, so, so IE by an integer. Because we're assuming, by the way, a lot of the things I'm going to say, you can make analogous statements in manifolds besides R3 or S3. Um, uh, but uh, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to stick to those cases. Um, so our knots are knots in R3 or S3, whichever you pre prefer. Um, therefore, they have a ciphered surface. They have a ciphered framing. Therefore, any other framing, just you just have to say how it differs from the ciphered framing. OK. okay. So these are the three ingredients you need to define the satellite. <coughs> And then the satellite of K with pattern P, satellite of K with pattern P is just the knot. So the notation for it is PK. And by definition, it's just the image of, uh, of uh, P under the diffeomorphism uh, phi. And by the way, this, this notation is hopefully suggestive of something. You should really think of any given pattern as giving you a function from the set of knots to the set of knots. OK? All right. OK. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is determined by an integer, I'll say n. And then I'm going to put it in here to indicate. Right. It depends on the framing I took, so we have to ind indicate that framing somehow. And if n is 0. So in other words, using a ciphered framing, then we just have p, p of k is, p, k is p0. So if I don't put any, anything down there, I mean use a ciphered framing to make the identification. Okay. So just a very simple example. Um, so suppose our companion knot is just the right-handed trefoil. And now suppose, um, OK. Well, Maybe different colors would be helpful. And then we have uh, the solid torus V. And in the solid torus, I'm just going to use the kind of a, a, a whitehead double kind of pattern. That's just the linking guy like that. And <coughs> then if you form, uh, uh, so this is P, of course. And now if you por perform P, K, and I'm going to draw it, and I'm sure. Some of you out there are going to complain, but I'll change it in a second. And what am I missing there? OK. And now we have to put a right-handed class. OK. So that's an example, right? So if you identify this red torus with a neighborhood of k and look at the image of p, you're going to see something like this. Now, according to my notation here, this isn't quite right. Everybody knows the blackboard framing on the trefoil is actually plus 3. Um, so if I draw this thing where there's actually no twisting, this is really actually um, that one. And if you prefer, you could put three full twists in here and then just call it PK. Okay. All right. 
Any questions about the satellite construction? All right, good. <coughs> oh, should have said this before I erased it. Uh, uh, any theorem I'm going to state toward the end here is actually joint worth work with uh, Vera Verteshi. But I'll mention her again. So, Okay. Ah, good. So we need, um, so later we will need, basically we're going to need a way to kind of put extra twists in and remove extra twists from, uh, from the construction. So we're going to need uh, the following map. So the map from S1 cross D2 to S1 cross D2, um, <coughs> which just takes, say, if you use coordinates, R theta on your disk and the angular coordinate on the circle, um, then this map just uh, sends. And I'm sure if you think about this for a second, you see what happens is you can think about this as cutting the solid torus open, putting a full right-handed twist, and gluing it back. That's the diffeomorphism you have here. Okay. Um, so this is just kind of a right, well, right-handed twist. Um, then the notation uh, p uh, delta p it just means delta the map delta applied to the pattern p. So if you have your pattern over here delta, for instance, over here, it would just kind of cut this thing open and put in a full right-handed twist. So for instance, if I did delta to three p, then um, sorry, delta to the minus three p, and I took that out, then that would be right. Anyway, never mind. You put in twists. OK. All right, good. I think that's all we need to say on the topological side of things. So let's try to bring the contact geometry um, back into the picture now. So, um, so bring in the contact geometry. Um, so first of all, um, there is a natural contact structure on, um, uh, well, S1 cross R, which we can think of as the, the tangents, the cotangent space of S1, right? That's just S1 cross R, uh, sorry, S1 cross R2. So the tangent space cross R. And so the, the, the tangent space here has a natural kind of, uh, um, so again, this is just uh, S1 cross R. And if you have coordinates theta and maybe x, um, then you have a natural Louisville form on the tangent space always, just x d theta. And there's a natural contact structure coming from the one form, or the kernel of the one form, if the coordinate here is z, just dz minus x minus the Louisville form, x d theta. Okay. So this is a contact structure on there. Uh, um, what did I want to say about that? Uh, well, and the contact structure, I guess, is really the kernel of that one form. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say there. So the second thing uh, that's uh, going to be important for us is given any Legendrian knot, um, say L. And again, I'm going to do S3 with a standard contact structure, but you might as well, at this point, think of any contact manifold would be fine. Um, um, given any Legendre on L, there is a standard neighborhood. I'll call it mu L um, of L that's contactomorphic. To uh, to this uh, S1 cross R with the contact structure I defined above. Okay. So basically, this basic model for a solid torus, or at least the interior of a solid torus, is really just a neighborhood of any possible Legendre knot you're ever going to see. What? Oh, thank you. Yes, S1 cross R2. Um, and maybe I should make one small uh, 
uh, comment here is uh, be careful. Um, this diffeomorphism, well, this contactomorphism, which among other things is a diffeomorphism, um, does not take, well, takes the product framing on S1 cross R um, to the contact framing on L, uh, not the zero framing. Right, so remember, the contact framing essentially is what the thurston binnikin invariant is measuring. Right, It's the difference from the Seifert framing. And so that's actually the framing that you're using when you make this identification. Okay. All right. All right, so. So given a Legendrian pattern, say um, Q in, um, uh, actually, l let me call it V. So really, well, before I was thinking of V as a solid torus. Now I'm thinking of it as the open solid torus. That doesn't, of course, really make any difference. But anyway, um, I just don't want to have to write S1 cross R2 or something over and over again, so V. So given a Legendre pattern in V, um, uh, we get a Legendrian satellite um, QL for any Legendrian not L. Um, in the knot type, in the smooth knot type, um, so here I have to be careful. So what is it? It's um, remember that's this framing issue that's coming up here, right? It's when you when you identify V with the neighborhood of L, you're not using the zero framing. So this this thing, if you're using that contactomorphism, <laughs> then um, you have to adjust by the thurston binnikin variant of the knot, Q applied to um, L. Okay, So this is a smooth knot coming from this topological operation. This is a Legendrian knot just by construction. right? Because given a Legendrian knot, it has a neighborhood contactomorphic to S1 cross R2, and then Q is mapped over by that diffeomorphism. right? Maybe it's not necessary, but all the heads weren't nodding vigorously enough, so maybe I'll do another example. Um, is that? OK, so we've got the Legendre knot L. And um, the pattern, um, just, just for ease, I'm going to cut my solid torus open. Um, and if you do that, here's a nice, simple pattern in the solid torus. By the way, you can actually see, if you think about this, this contact structure, if you just project out this, uh, sorry, if you project out that R factor, you get kind of front projections like you're used to when you're looking at knots in R3. Um, so that does define a pattern, um, Q. Um, then the Legendrian uh, satellite of this is uh, So you just take your knot and push it up. So just push it up to get the two strands here. And then just at some point, I, I insert this, uh, this, uh, little, um, this little kind of clasp here. And again, I'm not drawing crossings. Again, if everybody's familiar with, with front diagrams, the crossings are always determined because this always means that. Right? The, lower, the, the more negative slope is always in front of the more positive slope. Okay, good.
And, and by the way, this is in the, the, the not type, um, uh, delta q, so the smooth type, smooth not. It's just delta q l. Okay. That's the smooth not type. Um, uh, sorry, uh, no, that's right. Uh, okay. Good. So uh, a few remarks on this, this operation to try to convince you. Uh, the first one is to convince you that hopefully this operation should be thought of as a fairly interesting operation. Um, the original um, Eliash or Chikhanov Eliashberg knots were satellites. of uh, the unknot. The idea was if you take, an, if you take some Legendrian unknots and you basically perform this satellite operation on them, you wind up getting these twist knots that Eliashberg and Shikhanov used uh, uh, were the first examples of Legendrian non-simple knot types. So, so knots that were not determined by the Thurston-Minikin and rotation numbers. Okay. Right. Secondly, um, the construction was further studied in Lenny Ng's uh, uh, thesis and also um, uh, Ng and Trainer um, <coughs> studied Legendrian patterns. And even some satellite operations, but they're, I think, primarily interested in the, the Legendre knots in, in S1 cross R2, or the one jet space of S1. So this was uh, some of the previous work um, done. Um, I guess there's one other bit of previous work, but I'll save that for later. So now, given a knot, a smooth knot type, K, um, um, and pattern P, um, we can define. So basically, remember, the whole idea here is try to understand how Legendre knots behave under the cabling operation, or the satellite operation. So, um, so we can find the following map. I'm going to call it sat for satellite prime, um, which is the sum over integers t and z of Legendre knots, sorry, Legendre knots um, in the knot type k, t, I'll explain that in a second, cross. Legendrian knots in V are solid torus in the knot type of our pattern. Um, oh, sorry, knot type of minus delta to the minus T of our pattern. Okay, so we take the union of all of these things, and that maps to the Legendrian knots in the knot type of the pattern applied to K, so of that satellite. Okay, so this is a satellite knot. This is the companion knot. This is the pattern knot. Um, and I should mention here this notation. This means the, uh, the Legendrians in uh, Leg K such that the Thurston Binnikin of L is T. So if the Thurston Binnikin is T, I have to correct what the pattern looks like if when I pre perform the Legendrian satellite operation, I want to get something in a fixed knot type. Okay, right. So I've got a fixed knot type here. If I just use Legendrian knots and the pattern, uh, Legendrian patterns without correcting the twisting, I would actually get things in, in twisted, in, in, in the, the satellites having been twisted some number of times. So you have to compensate here or somewhere. Okay? What's the same? What? On either side. What's the same? Like compensating. 
yeah, but I wanted to get into, but I want one fixed knot type here. I want those genre knots in one fixed knot type here. But you're right. I mean, if I didn't put it here, I'd have to put it here. But then I'd be getting, um, uh, the, the domains would be changing then depending on what I plugged in, right? And <laughs> sorry, the, the, the ranges would be changing um, depending on what I plugged in, right? Because it would vary with T. Yeah. So I want this to be independent of T. Okay. But it's clear that, hopefully it's clear from what we discussed over there, that any Legendrian uh, companion here and any Legendrian pattern here, when you perform the Legendrian satellite operation, you get something in this knot type. Okay. So there is this well-defined map, and you could ask, you know, well, is this an isomorphism? Or a, a bijection, of course, isomorphism doesn't make any sense. But is this a bijection? Um, actually, you very quickly determine that that's a ridiculous question, but I'll uh, maybe break the question down in a few pieces. So the first question is, um, is um, sat prime onto? So if you're trying to see if it's a bijection, the first thing you might ask is, do you hit everything? Uh, second question, um, what, do you, what do you need to mod out by to get an injection? So basically, what do you have to mod out by here in the domain to get an injection? I, I claim if you just sit down, play with the pictures for like five minutes, you're going to easily see this is not injective. So you have to mod out by some equivalence relation. Um. <coughs> and then obviously, the main thing we're interested in is um, um, can we obtain new classification results using SAT prime. So in other words, if you get a bijection, then you've got a new classification results for whatever satellite, uh, oper whatever satellite knots you can prove that's a bijection for. Well, assuming you understand the things in the, in the domain. So for the rest of the talk, I would like to you know, just discuss what we can say about each of these questions. Um, but before we get going, let me actually define one other map, which is why I put a prime there. Um, uh, we have the same questions for um, the map sat um, ledge k t bar. I'll define that in a second. Cross ledge b p to Ledge Legendrians in well to Legendrians in P. Okay, uh, okay. Um, where this means uh, T B uh, T bar means uh, the maximum of the Thurston Binnikin numbers of all Legendrian knots in the knot type K. So the max, basically, T, B, T, T bar is just the maximum Thurston Binnikin invariant. So instead of looking at everything, just look at the maximum Thurston Binnikin guys, um, and it makes the domain significantly simpler. Of course, it also makes it probably harder to be onto, um, but it does mean you've got a better chance of it being injective. Um, so these are two maps you might want to look at. OK, so password. There's a question? Well, so here, so each one of these is the set of Legendrians with a fixed Thurston Binnikin. And I looked at all possible Thurston Binnikins, right? So for large t, this is empty. For low t, it's very large. Here, I'm just saying only look at the maximum Thurston Binnikin representatives. You know, there, this is some finite set. Um, we don't know exactly what it is in most cases, but it's some finite set, where that, of course, is some infinite set. So I've just tried to make the domain simpler. And again, you might think that it makes it much, much harder to be onto here. Uh, but again, I claim, since it's a much, much smaller set here, the injectivity part is at least easier. So again, depending on their question, one of them might be nicer to work with than the other, right? <coughs> oh, did I not put a? Oh, yes, thank you. I see. I didn't understand your question, and of course, you're absolutely right. Right. I, I, I need to fix. I need to fix the 
twisting in the, yes, thank you, excellent. Somebody's paying more attention than I am, good. <clears throat> Boy, I can't even read my own notes, oh well. All right, <clears throat> so past work. Um, so if k1 is a knot, is any knot, and p is, so we've got our solid torus here, and I'm just going to put some other knot, any other knot I like, just right there, except I'm going to take one of the strands and swing it around um, the core of the torus. Right? So um, it's kind of interesting to kind of play around with this, and you can pretty quickly convince yourself that if you take the pattern applied to k1, what do you get? Pop quiz. <laughs> Get the connect sum, exactly. So actually, that first theorem I told you was an example of a satellite operation. So the connected sum is a satellite operation. Um, and the, 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 the theorem and the theorem above says, um, uh, well, actually, sorry, what did, uh, well, the, the theorem above says, uh, Sat prime is injective is a, a bijection when you mod out by the equivalence that was in that theorem. So you can state that equivalence in terms of this, right? Is basically you're saying um, for sat prime, if you've got a Legendrian and you've got the pattern and you stabilize one and you form the satellite operation, it would be the same thing as stabilizing the other one. Right. So if you mod out by that equivalence and then obvious topological symmetries, um, sat prime is a, is a bijection. So this whole thing, uh, basically, you can assume, you can kind of think of this talk as essentially trying to generalize that first theorem I stated. Um, <coughs> All right, so what else? Um, two, um, if k1 is the unknot, and the pattern is a PQ curve on, um, well, a PQ curve. And by that, I just mean, so here's V. Take, think of a kind of a subtorus in V and just draw a PQ curve on that torus. So just some, some embedded curve that sits on a torus parallel to the boundary. And you know, P is kind of, it runs uh, around this direction P times, and it, it runs kind of meridionally Q times. Um, so all, all curves that sit on a torus can, can, can be uh, written like that. Um, then uh, also with Kohanda, um, I think it was about 2001. I'm not exactly sure, more or less. Question um, uh, says, um, I think in that case, uh, in that case, I think it's that sat is a bijection. And by the way, what do you get when you take the unknot and you take these things? You basically get torus knots. So basically, you can classify torus knots, and they basically come from, again, a satellite operation if you want to think of them that way. Um, OK. No, no. Yeah, because it turns out, right, so, so you, you need to know two things here, right? So. Um, you need to know the Legendre and unknots, but then you also need to know the patterns. And the, neg the negative twisting patterns in V actually are much more complicated than the positive twisting ones. And that just shows up in the classification. Yeah? What? Uh, K K1 is the companion knot, right? Anytime K will al almost always be a companion, and P's will be patterns. Sure. Sure. I'm basically rephrasing a bunch of result, previous results that weren't thought about in terms of satellites in terms of the satellites because we're trying to understand when these, when we can, how we can answer these questions, right? We'd like to understand how they ask the questions, and here are some some answers, right? Okay. Though still using the unknot, but slightly more interesting than this example. Um, it's three. Um, again, k the unknot. 
and the pattern now, um, again, I'll take this little uh, whitehead double, but now just maybe I'll put an M there, and we'll put an M twists. Okay. So now if you, if you, if you perform uh, uh, PMK, well, as you said, the unknot is kind of universal in some sense. So that actually is the knot, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> Uh, is th these, these are usually called twist knots. And by the way, I don't know, have I already erased it? Um, yes, that's actually these. So the original Elyashberg Chikhanov examples were twist knots. So those actually fall into this, this, uh, into this uh, group. Um, and then basically, um, Linian, uh, Linian uh, Vera and I um, were able to basically show, um, interpreted in this language, um, um, show sat. So again, this is sat, not sat prime, um, is a bijection um, after modding out, well, af after sometimes modding out. by an equivalence. To describe the equivalence, I'd have to tell you kind of the classification of patterns in here, which I will do later, but it's a little hard to say now. But there's a very small little equivalence you have to kind of throw in in certain cases to get sat to be um, a bijection, but, um, but uh, sometimes it's just a bijection on the nose. <coughs> OK. So these are kind of all more or less positive results. They're kind of saying, you know, the map sat or sat prime is onto. We know when it's injective or what we have to do to make it injective. And great. So the last bit of prior work I, I can mention here um, is actually kind of a, a negative result. Um, and that's if, uh, if k is a. Um, positive PQ torus knot. And the pattern is um, an RS curve um, in V. So again, what I mean by that is take a, a torus parallel to the boundary, and you have an RS curve on there. So this is basically an RS cable of the PQ torus knot. Um, then if S over R is uh, not in 0 to PQ, so this interval, then um, sorry, um, I didn't tell you which is longitude and which is meridian, so it doesn't really matter. But just to make my own, make myself feel better, I think I'm going to write that. Um, then uh, uh, then sat um, is a bijection. And this is actually, so for the positive knots, this is actually due to Tosin, one of my former graduate students, who, by the way, is looking for a job this year. So anybody that's on watching online or in the audience, um, take note. <laughs> um, but uh, if R over S is in this interval, then um, sat and sat prime are not onto. Not onto. So that kind of kills your hope that you're going to get a bijection here in general, or in particular, at least be onto in general. So let me give you a brief example of that, a simple example. Um, so, example. So, suppose. Um, we take PQ equal to R, uh, uh, sorry, equal to uh, 2, 3 equal to uh, RS. So PQ and RS are the same thing. Oh, by the way, this, uh, this, is, this is due to uh, uh, Co and myself um, for, uh, well, for that, that one example. <laughs> and then in general, it's due to, um, um, Douglas Fountain uh, and also uh, Blint Tosin and myself. 
Um, <coughs> but anyway, this is the example that, uh, that I worked out with, with Co. And what you see is I'm going to, um, this is a, um, the image. So we're going to plot all pairs, rotation number of a Legendrian knot, and the Thurston Bennekin of the Legendrian knot um, for all L in Lige K, for, well, uh, in the satellite. So just we're going to plot all of the Thurston Bennekin rotation pairs. So we're going to do rotation along kind of the x-axis and the Thurston Bennekin along the, the y-axis. And you wind up getting the following picture. And so on. It just goes on down from there. Um, but basically, uh, this is, um, uh, what is it? It's uh, 1, 6, and minus 1, 6 is these top two peaks. And by the way, when I have a point here, it means there's a Legendrian there. When I have an arrow, when I have a, an edge here, it means to get down to there, I, I stabilize that knot and I move down. It can stabilize positively or negatively, so you can increase or decrease the rotation, but you always decrease the Thurston Bennekin. So you get this kind of what people typically call a mountain range picture for, um, that represents the, 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 the Legendrians um, in that knot type, at least in terms of their Thurston Bennekin rotation. And so basically, the white thing that I've drawn here, this is the image of SAT. Um, not just the image of sat prime and sat, um, actually. Um, but that's not the complete classification. There's actually other Legendrians around. It turns out there's an extra one here. So putting that circle there means there's actually two Legendrians here. One is the white one that was a stabilization of that one. And there's a new one that just kind of popped out of thin air. Similarly, there's one over here. And these two, when I stabilize them, they actually become the same. But when I stabilize them in this direction, they stay different. They stay different, they stay different, and so on stay different. Now there's three there, and so on. So these red ones, these are not in the image of sat prime. So basically, if you're just looking at the kind of obvious constructions you can do um, over here, you're missing out on these. And if you look at this other, this other work, you can actually see there's huge kind of huge regions that you're missing. You always get some kind of some background mountain range that contains at least one representative of every TBNR, but then there's some big swaths that you miss. Oh, yeah. But you can't hit the, the maximum TB is, uh, is always hit by something in the white. Uh, for, for these examples, that is true. Yes, yes. So you always get these max ones from the from the SAT operation. In fact, actually, this is this is a general feature. I don't think I'll get a chance to get to it. Um, I definitely won't get to it uh, today, but um, it, it turns out in many, many cases you can actually, uh, using these maps, classify everything at the maximum level. Or at least give a list, sorry, I should say give a list of things, then you have to figure out if they're the same or not. But give a list of things at the maximum level, but then the stuff below it becomes much harder. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, <clears throat> So this is what's been known, and it tells us that we can frequently hope this is actually has a chance of being close to a bijection, but in some cases you're going to miss out on an infinite set. Um, so of course you start to ask, what can you? Are there conditions you can put on either the knot K or the pattern P that will kind of guarantee that, that you're onto or injective or or something? And so that brings us to the first result. So I'd like to um, give a little definition first. Um, a knot type K is called um, uniformly thick or UP because of where I graduated from. But um, anyway, uh, if any solid torus in uh, representing K in S3. So first of all, let me pause for a second. What do I mean by a solid torus representing a knot type? Well, I mean just look at the core of the solid torus. That is a knot. And if that knot is in the knot type K or isotopic to K, you, you say the, the solid torus represents the knot type. Um, so if any solid torus representing K in S3 um, can be contained in a solid torus, Um, that 
is a standard neighborhood of um, a Legendrian in Lege K with, I guess I should give it a name, Legendrian L in Lege K with Thurston Binnikin equal to the max Thurston Binnikin of K, which is what I called T bar earlier, right? Okay. So basically, so remember, any Legendre knot has a standard neighborhood. And it turns out that if you have a solid torus that looks like a standard neighborhood, there's a unique Legendre associated to it. So you can kind of think of studying Legendre knots as the same thing as studying solid tori that are, in some sense, standard. And what I mean by standard is the image of a diffeomorphism from the example I gave you at the beginning of the talk. That's the standard neighborhood. So, <clears throat> So you're uniformly thick if any solid torus can be thickened like this. And it seems like a little bit of a strange definition. And um, when you first see it, you think, gee, there's no chance that anything is possibly uniformly thick. But of course, I wouldn't have given you the definition if there wasn't actually such examples. Um, <clears throat> and um, so first, I guess, some examples of things that are not. So the unknot is not. UT. So that's a little disappointing. The first thing you try is not, but it's not for kind of stupid reasons, as is almost always the case with the unknot um, for almost all properties. And positive torus knots are not UT. Um, negative torus knots. UT. So not UT, not UT, but R UT. Um, <clears throat> for um, the connected sum of UT knots are UT um, sufficiently negative cables of UT knots are UT. Um, what else? Just to have all the examples on one board. Well, OK, I'll go to the next board. It's bad board work to try to squeeze it in the corner, right? OK. Um, uh, what number am I on? Lost track, five, six. OK. Um, <coughs> The figure eight is probably UT. I'm say 90, what should I say? I'm being recorded. I was going to say 99%. I'm being recorded. I'll say 95%. Sure that the universe, uh, basically, uh, Ko and I thought quite a bit about uh, this example. And we're pretty sure we could prove it. But we're also pretty sure we didn't want to you know, spend the ex extra you know, 20 or 30 pages in an already like 50 page paper to do so. So we quit. Um, but it would be nice if somebody verified this someday. But I'm, 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 I'm pretty confident it is. A little bit less confident, um, all twist knots. I should actually point out the figure eight is an example of a twist knot. Right? Um, all twist knots, uh, well, almost all. You know, if you put enough qualifiers in, it's got to be a true statement. But anyway, almost all twist knots um, are maybe. <laughs> UT. This I'll give maybe a 60% confidence rate. Um, so, well, if, if you allow me to generously interpret almost, then I'll put 100%. But, um, <clears throat> well, the reason for that is um, because one of the twist knots you can get is a positive uh, trefoil knot. So that's not universal. So clearly it can't be all. Um, one of them is the figure eight, which I'm very confident is, uh, is um, uniformly thick. So what about the rest? Well, oh, by the way, one of the twist knots is the unknot, actually. <laughs> Um, that's not uniformly thick. So, so, um, but I think the, th the claim is, as long as M is not small, it should be uniformly thick. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a graduate student at the University of Georgia um, that was working on this for a while. And um, it actually looks a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to. I still kind of believe it's true, but it's certainly a lot more, more difficult than I would have guessed. Um, so, so that's why I will make it very low confidence, but certainly about 50%. OK, great. So that gives you some examples. And we're running out of time here. Um, 
So let me at least state one of the new theorems. Um, so uh, if k is ut, then sat is on to. Okay, this is actually a relatively easy theorem. In fact, you should probably just call it a lemma or something. But, um, but great. So there, there are a class of knots where you can guarantee that this map is onto. Um, and, and I think it's going to be a relatively large class, but you're certainly missing out on a lot of things with that. Um, so what about the other? What about injectivity? Now that we have surjectivity in some cases. So So since we're running short of time, let me just draw a couple of pictures to indicate an equivalence that you have to put on, um, uh, on that map, um, say SAT, on, on the domain of that map, uh, uh, if you want to possibly get injectivity. And that's the following. So suppose you have two Legendre knots, L1 and L2. And now I'm going to draw their, again, their Thurston Binnikin and rotations kind of on the board. And suppose I stabilize them, and I stabilize them, but always one, say, positively and one negatively, and I get to the same knot. Let me maybe call it L tilde. Okay. So it turns out um, um, if we have a, um, um, if there, uh, sorry, and, and now suppose, uh, and I had some pattern, say, Q for L1 and a pattern Q2 for L2. So I form the, the Legendrian satellite here. I get something. I form the Legendrian satellite here, something. What would guarantee that they're the same? Well, if I had a pattern down here, Q tilde, such that, um, um, such that Q1 was So basically, however many stabilizations I've done here, so if this was um, n positive stabilizations, I'm going to have n zigzags. Um, and then down here, so q1 is this with q tilde. And q2 is kind of the opposite. The zigzags are going up. And then you have q tilde there. So basically, if these two things actually came from this by adding zigzags that corresponded to the stabilizations, um, then they actually have to, that, that's something that will definitely say that these satellites are the same. Um, sorry, that picture is probably, that one hopefully you can see. So maybe, um, and Q2. So you have the zigzags, except they're going up. And then you have Q tilde there. So if q1 and q2 are related by that, and l1 and l2 are related like that, then these two things have to be the same. So this is something you have to mod out by. And um, so maybe I'll finish with one last theorem and make a couple of very quick comments. So the last theorem I'll state, at least, on the writing um, <coughs> is uh, if k is uniformly thick and Legendrian simple, then sat is a bijection um, after you mod out by the above equivalence. OK. so. Again, this, this gives you a theorem where you could then hopefully classify uh, Legendre knots in a satellite knot type if you understand enough about the underlying companion knot and you understand about the patterns. And that means, of course, we know a lot about knots. I mean, you have classifications of torus knots, figure eights, twist knots, lots of things. Um, but what about patterns? What do you know about patterns? So there's been some nice work done by Linny and Lisa that, that show that kind of distinguish patterns. But are there classifications? Well, some other results of Vera and I um, classify basically all braided patterns. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say classify, but at least give you uh, lists of all braided patterns and classify them in some contexts. Um, they give you, uh, we also classify all um, whitehead-like patterns. 
Um, so there's lots of examples of patterns where we do have a pretty good understanding. And from those, you can get new classification results. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to tell you more about those um, later. But since we're out of time, I think I won't, uh, I won't keep you from your cookies any longer. Um, uh, so yes, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.